Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Elizabeth Hill. She is Professor of Psychology at the University of Detroit Mercy in the United States. Her primary areas of research interest focus on evolutionary and comparative psychology. She has investigated the interaction between biological and environmental factors in risk-taking behavior. In this research, she used evolutionary theory related to parental investment and life history strategies to conceptualize environmental factors, especially the impact of an unpredictable family environment. The areas of impulsivity, risk drink, risky drinking and risk taking have been of most interest. So, Dr. Hill, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm impressed that you and your, your uh, listeners would be interested in these topics. Oh, I'm all interested in these kinds of things. I mean, I've already had several different evolutionary psychologists on the show and people that work with evolutionary theory applied to human psychology and behavior. And so that's of interest to me and also to my listeners. So there's no problem there. Uh, so let me ask you first, because today we're going to talk a little bit about life history, parental investment, uh, and the effects that some of those things have on particularly risky behavior, but I mean the behavioral, behavior in general of adolescents mainly, uh, and the repercussions that that has in their lives. So the first question I would like to ask you is, what is life history theory about? Well, it's a subset of evolutionary theory, and it focuses on the evolution of characteristics of lifetimes, so that the lifetime itself is variable and an outcome. And uh, initially, it was developed to look at differences between species, and uh, species, particularly species that lived in environments that were uh, stable versus environments that were uh, uh, variable or unpredictable, this kind of thing, mm -hmm. so that you could um, explain differences in life cycles of uh, elephants versus salmon or that kind of thing, or different kinds of salmon. Mm -hmm. So. Elements of the life cycle might be things like uh, how long it takes to mature when you when you start having offspring, how long you live afterward, how many offspring, uh, that kind of thing. When you die uh, is a variable. So it's uh, a newer approach to try to apply that to differences within species, mm -hmm. but that started. Uh, even with people, maybe 30 years ago, uh, anthropologists looking at the huge variety of human beings and the environments that they are in and the patterns that they have in births and deaths and growth. Uh, and um, that has, that has uh, been worked on more, but it's still a little, it, it's in process. It's still a little unclear exactly how it happens that people in the same species, even though there's all this variety, uh, end up look, looking so different. For, for example, even in a city like Chicago or, or Detroit, if you look at different neighborhoods, the average lifespan there, maybe one neighborhood, uh, it will be 55 years old. Maybe another neighborhood, it will be 77. So that's a 20-year span. And, and, and we usually don't think about things like that as being so, so variable. But then if you look all over the world at other societies, you see even more variety in terms of that kind of aspect of, 
of life. Mm -hmm. So as you were saying at the beginning, uh, first people tried to apply life history theory in the sense of comparing different species and understanding if, for example, one species that evolved in a particular kind of environment had a faster or slower life history. And I guess that in our case as humans, we in general have slow paced life histories in the sense that we have long periods of development, but then within species, and in this case particularly within our own species, because people are exposed to different, um, to different influ uh, environmental influences, for example, then there are variable life history strategies that people can adopt to deal with those conditions they are exposed to. Is that correct? Well, it, I, I wouldn't put it in a way that it sounds so conscious that people are consciously selecting. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, not, not, know, co not it, consciously, but. It's a, sh a shorthand way of talking about uh, people's development. Uh, and I think a lot of our decisions and a lot of our behavior is largely unconscious, that we're not making rational decisions and laying out all the pros and cons of everything that we do, that it's, it's more just immediate and reactive mm -hmm. as a rule. But Yes, human beings have very long lifespans in general compared to um, our uh, other primates that are closest closest to us, and we have different uh, stages uh, of development, particularly maturation takes a whole lot longer uh, versus something like a chimpanzee, uh, but Yes, I, what 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 you were saying is is uh, basically correct. That environments differ a lot in uh, mortality patterns. What are the predators? Are the predators avoidable? Mm -hmm. uh, are the uh, are the uh, sources of food pred predictable? And are they seasonal? Are they how, how spread out are they? How much competition is there? How do you find them? So niches vary. Your ecological niches vary in a, all of those things. So when animals have become adapted, they can be they can be very different. And particularly how dangerous the environment is uh, is thought to be the main factor that would affect how quickly you mature, how quickly you start reproducing. Uh, so, I mean, and, and isn't it also the case that we have to take into account individual differences, like, per, like for example, differences at the level of personality, because is it the case that as humans, when we are exposed to, for example, unpredictable environments, that we all, in general, tend to adopt uh, fast, life history strategies or do we do we also have to take into account uh, individual differences and how each person uh, deals with the environment she is exposed to? Well that's an area of new research which I am not doing. I'm, I'm trying to keep track of what's going on in that area, but um, it there, there's a, a new area looking at something called differential susceptibility to the environment, and there are uh, some collaborations of other researchers going on. For example, someone named Jay Belsky is a developmental psychologist who started thinking about life history uh, theory and and people 30 years ago or 20 25 years ago I, I'm not sure when he began thinking about it but 
He, he, I think, is the first person who came up with this term differential susceptibility, where there may be some genetic factors or biological factors that influence how susceptible someone is to the environment when you're, when you're a child. And uh, another person who's looking at this is Bruce Ellis, who's done a lot of work in unpredictability, also working in child development. So uh, what both of them are looking at is variation among people, uh, not in personality, but or you, I don't know if you would call it personality, but physiology, mm. particularly in terms of how reactive you are to stress. So this is uh, part of the... Um, uh, cortisol, hypothalamic, uh, adrenal gland system, how reactive you are to stressful e events. And some people are very moderate. They don't react much. Their heart do rate doesn't go up. Their cortisol doesn't go up. Or if it does go up, it comes down quickly. Other people have a more pronounced response that keeps going. And apparently what this what can happen then is not necessarily bad. It can be either bad or good. Mm -hmm. But some people will be susceptible to that environmental influence and some people will not or will be less susceptible. So it makes it very difficult uh, to figure out both what, what direction uh, a change may be. Will it be that someone will be very reactive to... Uh, positive things, positive influences, opportunities, that might happen. It also might happen that if you're in a bad environment that you will have more and more effects of prolonged stress mm -hmm. and the effects on your, on your nervous system of stress hormones. So that's one thing that a lot of research is, is, is going on right now, that uh, it's not necessarily going to be known exactly what the reaction will be. Some, some, uh, some people with a different physiology or genetic makeup may, may be less affected by the environment than others that are more sensitive. So the names that uh, Bruce, Bruce Ellis is giving to these different outcomes one is uh, the high reactivity, could be called, uh, on, on one extreme, vigilant. Mm -hmm. People who grow up vigilant, always on, uh, always, uh, on guard for negative things happening. Mm -hmm. And other people are sensitive. They could be called sensitive, but also sensitive in a very good way in that they will, they will be responsive to and take advantage of good opportunities. Mm -hmm. But... What it may mean is that some people are going to be less responsive to the environment. And it's, it's not going to be that there is maybe one personality or one or genes that we can find, but more how the stress response system is set up, something like that. Mm -hmm. So in your own work and while trying to understand behaviors like risk taking and different kinds of risk taking, uh, what were the aspects or principles of life history theory that you applied? Well, I um, was very struck by how ecologists looked at the environment mm -hmm. from a very um, broad level and how they looked at the predictability of resources and whether uh, mortality risks could be avoided mm -hmm. and, and how, um, how the life history theory um, looked at parental investment in terms of how effective can it be? Now that that sounds kind of um, uh, cold, thinking about human beings. But if you're looking at other animals, there there may be times when parental investment is not going to make any difference. Mm -hmm. So, 
if if mortality is not avoidable mm -hmm. and the investment is not beneficial then if you're looking at a lot of animals, you see animals that don't have any parental care at all. You, you, you lay your eggs underneath the ground or you put your eggs in the water, no parental care because there's not anything you can do that is going to uh, be a, a, an effective investment. So back to your question, um, at the same time I had learned uh, from uh, uh, biologists um, about more about the concept of unpredictability and there was a biologist who was a student of Robert Trivers who came up with the conceptualization of parental investment and parent offspring conflict one of his students w was named James Weinrich and he wrote a paper I think the first paper I saw that used unpredictability uh, trying to understand differences in uh, people with different incomes and occupations, applying it to human humans, and in terms of what he called, this was like 1977, uh, what he called pair bonding, how how a predictable income, uh, predictable resources would relate to pair bonding or not. You know, uh, what will be the uh, benefits of maintaining a pair, a pair to rear, rear offspring, benefits or costs. So um, when I looked at human families, I tried, um, I tried to take these ideas about how ecologists look at the environment and see uh, what what are, how are we looking at human environments in terms of these same aspects mm -hmm. uh, mortality dangers crime in the neighborhood and uh, predictability of resources with animals that would be food uh, with human beings it it would be in anything which would influence predictability of daily life so it to me those ideas from ecology and life history theory translated into human beings predictability of the parental behavior predictability of the home even routines even like uh, the parents behaviors toward the children meal times that that kind of thing predictability of daily routines so um, that uh, predictability of daily routines would lead into beliefs or understandings about predictability of the world mm -hmm. I mean that's the kind of a leap with human beings that we have brains that develop schemas to understand the world so we would be able to form a picture of the world is predictable or even if you're an animal to form a habit that the the day is predictable or from day to day your habits will be similar and I was working at uh, the University of Michigan Alcohol Research Center and I don't know if uh, you have the same con concept or description in in your country, but at, at that time, uh, 20 years ago, uh, there was a, a way of describing families with alcoholic parents, parents who have problems with alcohol, as a family chaos. Mm -hmm. Family chaos because um, the the parents wouldn't be fulfilling their their routines they may be absent they may they may spend the, their paycheck on alcohol so that the life they, they may they may be unpredictably angry or abusive to the children and the the chaos concept uh, reminded reminded me of 
the unpredictability concept mm -hmm. from life history. So, um, we're working with uh, a, a uh, I, we call them postdoctoral fellows or postdoctoral researcher named Lisa Thompson Ross at the Alcohol Research Center. We came up with the idea of looking at family unpredictability in people uh, stimulated by this idea of what happens in families with parents who are have alcohol problems because there really did seem to be chaos going on, that it wasn't just the parents were not doing very well and they were predictably poor uh, or not doing well in their jobs or that they were mean all the time. It's that they changed from day to day that they could change. So now I've I've gone on. I, I want to make sure I'm answering the question you actually asked. <laughs> so. Uh, so, uh, I, I mean, basically, I guess that what I was asking is, uh, well, first of all, what are the kinds of things that render an environment or the environment where the child or the adolescent is developing in an unpredictable environment. I guess that you've already referenced or made reference to some of those things, but uh, I mean, what distinguishes in terms of family dynamics, let's say, a predictable from an unpredictable environment? Well, people will actually say um, that they keep changing their minds about the rules for their children. Or they they make a, a threat and then they don't carry it out. Mm -hmm. Or they um, give different amounts of affection from one day to another. Mm -hmm. uh, one day you go to your parent and they will be too irritated by you to care about your skin knee. Another day, the next day you go, and they're very concerned and warm. So one of those days they may be under the influence of a substance, and another day they may not, so that they are not giving you a consistent uh, warm response. And it's, it's important for ch children to have, especially some kind of, predictable responsiveness of the parent to their needs and if someone is under the influence of a substance they they may not care it, it may not be it may not reach into their awareness that the child is uh, uncomfortable or in pain or needs something um, another thing is the the idea of the unpredictable meals or money that simply that uh, some months you can't pay the electric bill, some months you can't pay the uh, gas bill, some bill collector shows up at your door. Another month you may have a lot of money. Uh, so it's, it's the unpredictability aspect. Uh, on the meals scale, it's uh, something like uh, some the the questions we ask, uh, like this, the same people sit down for dinner every night, uh, or uh, it's better if people get their own meals, mm -hmm. and that's fine if you're teenagers, but not if you're younger. Um, so the other thing, the the unpredictable discipline. Like um, some sometimes when you do something wrong, you you may get paddled or spanked. Pe people don't do much paddling anymore, no. but spanked or punished. And then another time, nobody cares that that you didn't go to school. You know, so it's a it's a difference. It's not that nobody cares all the time. That would be predictable, but that. Sometimes they care, sometimes they don't. So we thought that that led to developing uh, 
an idea of the world as uh, very hard to understand and not predictable, and that because of that, uh, the future would be ignored or blocked out. You wouldn't think about the future, and it wouldn't be understandable, and so it wouldn't be valued, that only the here and now would be valued. Mm -hmm. Now, that's putting that in a very rational or cognitive way, which, mm -hmm. like I said before, I don't think that is how it operates. I think it's more just e emotional. I think it's more of an emotional um, mechanism, which we don't really understand about why you do the things that you do. And in what ways would those kinds of environments, of unpredictable environments, affect uh, children's and older people's that uh, older people that go through that kind of childhood uh, at the level of their behavior? Well, the way it would affect you is that you you would not. Uh, be thinking about the risks of your behavior. Mm -hmm. Every behavior has cost and benefits and risk-taking has uh, cost and benefits and the consequences are uh, either scary or just ignored and Depending on when the consequences might happen, uh, if the future is ignored or not predictable, uh, de devalued, then you don't care about consequences that are in the future. Uh, so you also don't care about rewards that are in the future. So what me that means is that rewards that are right now are more important than rewards in the future because the future may not happen and you don't think about it. And also, uh, consequences that are right now are more important than consequences that are in the future. So if you think uh, you can get a benefit today, and again, I'm saying think, let's say if it feels, if something will feel good today mm -hmm. and the consequences are tomorrow, then it's going to be m much more compelling to take that drink or go home with the person you don't really know or uh, drive the car because you might be able to drive even though you're under the influence. You might, you might not get stopped by the police. So... Uh, and then you're you're you might miss work tomorrow, but that's tomorrow. <laughs> so it's the difference between what's right in front of you and what might happen tomorrow. But tomorrow is uh, not important. Mm -hmm. You don't feel it doesn't feel it doesn't feel important in the same way. To make it important, and I, and I think I, I I I probably should say I think that people. Our base, our basic state is impulsivity. You know, mm -hmm. our natural state is impulsivity. If you look at children or, you know, other animals that we're related to, our basic state is impulsivity. It's not to plan ahead, mm -hmm. and and it's not to think through all the consequences and their probabilities of every behavior. In order to delay gratification. We need to be trained. Mm. So we need to be trained to uh, think about consequences and be afraid. And we need to be trained to uh, e elevate or enhance the future benefits so that we visualize them immediately and compare them to the pleasure that we would get immediately. It's it's difficult. People people really need to be trained in order to do that. It's not I don't think it's natural. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, and do you think there's any particular reason for that, for the fact that you think that our basic state is the one of impulsivity? Is it because, for example, during most of our evolutionary history, we lived as hunter-gatherers and foragers? And so, uh, for example, just to give an example, uh, when it came to food, people uh, hunted and gathered food and basically because they wouldn't be able to preserve it they had to consume all uh, right away or otherwise it it would go rotten or something like that and so basically do you think that could have had some influence in that basic state that we have or well i i think so but i'm i'm not an anthropologist i don't want to presume uh, to really know how our ancestors really lived before agriculture mm -hmm. but let's say we developed agriculture 10,000 years ago mm -hmm. maybe. I'm not even sure but 10 20,000 years ago we developed agriculture and we had to be able to predict the seasons anyway to predict uh, when the crop when to plant the crops when to grow when they would be ripe that kind of thing and even before that, I think people figured out uh, when the nuts would ripen, nuts on trees, when they would be ripe, when various plants would be ripe, even though we didn't plant them from seeds ourselves. We could track uh, when, when different fruits would ripen. So there, there had to be some, but, but I think in our ancestral past when we get that far back before agriculture I think um, it, it would have been very hard to plan ahead and I think um, it's it's pretty it's pretty recent that we we can plan ahead very very far and I think um, it it shows in uh, that I don't think we're very good even now you know, even people who have been trained to think about the future and plan ahead, it's still very hard for people to do that, even plan for their own retirement or plan for what is the planet going to be like 50 years from now. It's very, it's very hard to plan for the future. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when you talk about risky behavior, what kinds of behavior are you referring to when people develop fast life history strategies? Is it about, for example, being more aggressive and violent and things related to crime? Is it about uh, being more at risk? of becoming a, an alcoholic or addicted to, um, I, I don't know, gambling or, subst or, or substance abuse or something like that? Well, ri risky behavior is anything that threatens your survival. Mm -hmm. I think that's a way to look at it in that refraining from taking a risk, you're buying survival. Mm -hmm. So. It relates to the future because you're, you're buying survival in the future, so you have to have uh, value of the future. But risky behavior, uh, when I think about it, or in the questions that we asked in our questionnaires, mm -hmm. are, are uh, things having to do with s safety, se sexual risk, um, social risk too. So you're risking your social reputation which is very valuable to live in the world as a human being. Things like telling lies or calling in to work sick when you're not sick. So breaking rules, uh, social rules that threaten your social reputation and then uh, safety risks are things like uh, not wearing a seat belt in your car, uh, riding a motorcycle, uh, driving while intoxicated, uh, even th things things that seem like fun, like bungee jumping or parachuting. Th they're they're risky, uh, 
So anything that's a physical risk like that, um, and then back to uh, and getting into fights, physical fights, um, I wouldn't necessarily put crime in general into risk-taking because we were trying to get more at uh, risks that are uh, get at the safety. You're, you're, buying, you're buying survival in the future versus something that's pleasurable right now. So the, the sexual risk would be things like unprotected sex, uh, either so that you might get pregnant or you might catch a disease. So again, it's immediate uh, pleasure versus future disability or problems in the future. So uh, the, when I was doing this work, it was uh, before people were in the life history area were starting to call these fast and slow life histories. So I tend more to think of it as trade-offs. Trade-offs, you're trading off now versus later. Benefits now versus benefits later, as opposed to um, grouping a lot of things together. I'm not sure I would group crime. Mm -hmm. Crime has crime. Crime has many aspects to it, like white collar crime um, has many aspects to it that are very different from something like just getting angry and getting into a fight and not being able to control yourself some cr that that could result in uh, assault or or manslaughter um, whereas some crime is very deliberate it's more like predatory behavior if you were looking at animals than it is the kind of aggression that would be in the risk taking aggression although it's very it also can be very similar and gambling gambling can um certainly fit into the um, risk-taking category, you know, depending upon how uh, impulsive and is it, it is as opposed to a business. <laughs> so it, it, I, I always want to say it depends. Now, with drinking, there, the category of risky drinking is very interesting, and it's a very interesting way to look at all this because if you drink, uh, the the usual cutoff is something like five ounces, five drinks for men will usually make you intoxicated mm -hmm. so that you are, so a drink is a glass of wine, five glasses of wine, or five uh, bottles of beer, or, uh, you know, will usually make you intoxicated. So the idea is that you are losing your conscious control of what you're doing mm -hmm. and for many people that is a risk because of how you may or may not behave so risky drinking seems to follow the pattern of uh, risk taking in general in that the most common uh, de demographic group that engages in it is young men mm -hmm. so um, it also, it, it can entail a lot of uh, positives, a lot of fun things if you're intoxicated. So there's positives now, but then there may be consequences later. So it's a very good example of risk taking. And it's interesting that you refer to the demographic of young men because I mean, are there significant gender differences in terms of how people develop life history strategies? Um, I'm not sure there are differences in how they develop them, but there there are gender differences in the outcomes. Uh, it it. I, I recall from looking at your website that you you, you talked to Martin Daly. Mm -hmm. Martin right. Daly. Okay. He 
he and uh, Margo Wilson, who has passed away, um, wrote a, a paper in uh, a, a long time ago called the Young Male Syndrome. And they're using syndrome uh, because there are a lot of risks that are practiced by young men, drinking, fighting, riding motorcycles, et cetera, that seem to cluster together. And their paper was about how the clustering at that age seems to relate to the age where there is competition for mates. Mm -hmm. So I, I haven't looked at the video when you talked to him, so I don't know if you touched upon that, but um, where there is competition and there are some losers and some winners, mm -hmm. then there's more of a payoff for taking risks. Mm -hmm. So in general, if there's more variability in the outcomes of one sex than another, the sex that's more variable will take more risks because you have more to gain. And uh, some, there are some people who get totally pushed out of the competition. So in the past, it's less, it's less true today, but in the past there were uh, it wasn't very common for for women to have no children. Right. Most women got married and had some children, but uh, there were men. There were more men who had no children. They couldn't get married. They couldn't find a wife. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there were some men who had more than one wife, so there was more variance. And through through hi history you know, our, back to our ancestors, if that were the case, then there would be more advantages for men to take risks if it meant getting more resources or winning that wife or out-competing th the next man, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to w women who would, would be less variable, that it would be, uh, in general, easier for women to have a mate, uh, get get married or whatever, pair have a have a pair bonded relationship, so there would be less uh, advantages for women to take risks. The other thing that goes into that is is once you have any kind of sexual division of labor in childcare, mm -hmm. then there it will it will be. Uh, not advantageous for women to take a lot of risk if they have children depending on them so that women would be less likely uh, to risk their lives because in the past the children may not have anyone else uh, who will take care of them. So women would be less likely to uh, get into fights uh, where they might risk damage to themselves. They might actually risk dying. So we, we still have um, those aspects playing, playing into our life histories so that, um, well, in, in one of the, uh, in some research that I did, pe people who are married take less risks. They, they, they drink less. I was particularly looking at risky, risky drinking. So you can look at age and gender patterns and patterns of do you have children? Uh, and the risk-taking pattern seems to be that the, the risk-taking, the risk -taking, something like drinking, is going to occur before people have children. And um, that that's fortunate because, as I was just saying before, when parents have alcohol problems, they create an environment for the children that really is not very, very good. So um, now, in our contemporary society, there there is more uh, of a convergence of 
drinking patterns between men and women. You see more more women doing uh, risky drinking. Mm-hmm. And so that's changing a little bit just as women's lives are changing in, in general. Uh, drinking is going along with it. So I haven't looked at statistics about things like getting into fights or how many women are getting into fights. That would mm-hmm. that would be a big change if you saw more women getting into fights because that used to not happen except maybe for 17-year-old, 15-year-old uh, adolescent girls maybe um, looking at the statistics. So... Um, that's that you you still see you still see differences in ages and genders in the patterns of risk taking i think what happens is early in development which was the question that that you originally asked um that uh women are are very much trained to be cautious and to uh, avoid risks and that's still that's still true slightly less than it used to be but it's still true that women are are much more trained to try not to get hurt or do things that are dangerous and um, so we'll continue to see these patterns in in risk taking as long as that's the case I, I, I think that there there probably is a, a gender di- a difference uh, that um, relates to a biological difference. I'm not sure how much that is. What usually happens with um, with human behavior is we like we like to stereotype. Mm-hmm. So there probably is a, a small difference that's due to biology, a small difference in propensity to take risks. And I think what we do is we, we uh, with our training, we make that bigger mm-hmm. by training women to be afraid and be cautious and not take risks. So what starts out maybe as a small difference and it becomes a large difference and it becomes something that we, we stereotype people on. So now men have to take risks women can't take risks so we've spread apart uh, men, men, and, men and women in, in a way that uh, something seems very like a strong difference when it's not, it doesn't necessarily it's not necessarily unchangeable it might look unchangeable but and it might look biological but it's it's it, a lot of it might be training Mm-hmm. So, uh, I mean, you don't think that it would be fair for us to say that uh, men in general are more uh, biologically predisposed toward uh, risky behavior? Well, I'm not sure I would argue against the predisposition. Mm-hmm. You know, there may be a predisposition that um, men would, I, I guess what I would struggle with is what is what is the shape of the predisposition? Um, let's say it's testosterone. Uh, you know, then that that having testosterone early in development may change the brain a little bit so that uh, uh, Something that seems risky, like uh, I'm going to go to the bar and have a drink, and then maybe when the this this guy I don't know insults me, maybe I'll punch him. Um, that the what what the testosterone may do may make your system a little more responsive to something that seems rewarding so there's maybe a little change in the brain so the reward is seems a little more rewarding than without having that exposure to testosterone when you were in fetus let's say um and it might 
make a reaction a little bit stronger to somebody insulting you than otherwise. But that, you know, that propensity can either be uh, trained and fostered and encouraged, or it can be discouraged. You know, let's say if that were a woman, uh, who a woman would have had a lifetime of being cautioned against, you know, um, don't go out by yourself, don't stay out late, you know, don't, don't get drunk, you know, don't even, don't, don't even take a drink, somebody else might put something in, etc. And then, you know, um, don't fight back, you know, get out of there. So the, the difference between a feeling, I mean, let's say you have uh, a, a slight physiological difference, and then that translates into a difference in a feeling. It's very far from a difference in behavior. The other thing about all of these physiological differences or what we might call a propensity is that they all have a normal distribution. So let's say your propensity to feel anger or your propensity to feel um, uh, uh, happy at the thought of that ice cold beer um, that has a normal distribution. So there's a lot of people in the middle and there are people on the edges who have more, who have less. And whenever we talk about sex differences, there's those normal distributions overlap so that the, there might be a difference. I'm holding my hands up here. There might be a difference. Men and women, the average might be somewhat different. But then there's a lot of women who might feel more than a lot of men. Mm -hmm. So what we tend to do as people is to turn that difference in the averages into a, a stereotype. Mm -hmm. And then we think if a woman feels a way that doesn't fit the stereotype that she's abnormal. So uh, I, I always try to be careful whenever we say there's a gender difference just to, to say that because um, it's, it's, a it's usually a difference of quantity you know, not a difference, like there's a whole, it's not like we're different species, but there's a, a quantity difference, and it's important to, I guess, understand that there's a whole range in both sexes, so that if there's a man, you know, who, who doesn't want to fight, who wants to, you know, run away, don't fight, then that's understood that it's not that that man is a chicken you know but that's a response it's a defensive response in a situation that you know it fits the normal distribution so let's not be sometimes it leads to discrimination or prejudice against people who are off the average they're not on the average so they're abnormal I mean technically statistically they're abnormal you know but that's just a st st saying that statistically. But uh, it's ho so it's hard as human beings. We want to categorize things. We want to have categories, and we don't. It's hard to understand the uh, the whole range is is there and is normal. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, uh, that's very well put. I, I think. And uh, but could could it be the case that? Uh, there could be some differences in terms of the specific types of risky behavior that are more frequent in men and women. I mean, not risky behavior in general, but if we were to break it down into several different categories of risky behavior, then maybe men would be more predisposed to exhibit certain types and women other types I don't know well I I haven't really uh, thought about that enough I don't think uh, I I think somebody like Martin Daly maybe 
mm-hmm. he he might be able to. Um, I I think something like uh, the the fighting, I think, is a good candidate for uh, differences between the average man and and the average woman because of differences in the cost and benefits of 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 fighting mm-hmm. you know, for for um for men in many situations you do you have to compete uh you have to compete with other men so uh, uh the uh, however you need to do it uh physical fighting or verbal i think um that that's probably a, a a good a good candidate, and also historically looking at the statistics for for women fighting, it's not it's not been a frequent a frequent thing. Now, of course, you have uh, now you have women boxers. You know, we have a Olympic boxing champion from Michigan. You know, the same state, so. There you go. It's not. We're talking about averages. Right. You know, we can say on average you would expect something to be different, but you can always find an exception. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Dr. Hill, I'm starting to get mindful of your time. So let's end the interview here. Uh, but just before we go, would you like to tell people what would be some of the best places on the internet or elsewhere for them to learn more about your work? Well, actually, I, ha- I had a thought. I was going to uh, tell tell you that the uh, the scale that Lisa Thompson Ross and and I created called the Family Unpredictability Scale mm-hmm. has I see it has been translated into Portuguese, mm-hmm. and uh, that there are researchers at the University of Coimbra. Mm-hmm. You know that. Yes. That have used this. I don't know if you you know them, but maybe you could look up their their work. Teresa Sousa Machado mm-hmm. and Jose Silva mm-hmm. have are looking at family unpredictability in um, studies in in Portugal. So thought that would be interesting. Um, the 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 research that that I've done I the really the only place on the internet to find it is on ResearchGate. Right. There's a website called ResearchGate.net, and that's where I I uh, have listed the papers, and you can make requests there for copies of the papers if they're not already up there. Um, the other thing that I probably should say is that um, I probably should say these are my personal opinions and not the opinions of my university the University of Detroit Mercy wouldn't endorse them in any way we have academic freedom so um, I'm free to have any kind of opinions or do any research that I want Um, and then the other place you could find research like this would be the research society called the Evolution and Human Behavior Society, and they have a website. I'm I don't remember the website, but it's Human Behavior and Evolution Society. That's a good, a very good resource for different people who are working on um, looking at human behavior from an evolutionary perspective. Mm-hmm. Okay, very good. So I will be leaving all of that in the description box of the interview, Dr. Hill. And also thank you for referring to those two Portuguese researchers. I will certainly look them up. And uh, again, thank you a lot for taking the time to come on the show. It was a real pleasure to have you. Well, thank you for being so informed and uh, asking such good questions. 
Hi everybody, thank you for watching this interview until the end. As you might have noticed, I've started this channel in February 2018 and have been putting out regular interviews with academics and intellectuals from a variety of fields. To keep the channel sustainable, I would like to ask you to please visit my Patreon page and to consider making a pledge there. If you don't like Patreon, you also have the alternatives of Subscribestar and PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of the video. Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my patrons, Karen Litzke, Anne Blanchett, Perelga Larsen, Lau Guerrero, Santel Gilinas, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunda, Brian Rivera, Lucas Stafiniak, Sergio Gondriano, Jane Eninen, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, John Connors, Adam Castle, Vega Giddy, Doctors Jerry Muller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, and Bo Weingard, and also my three producers, Isar Webb, Rosie, and Jim Frank. Thank you for all.